Chapter 26, Sacrifices The weekend was unbelievably long. Phoebe arrived with her suitcase on Saturday morning. I said, Golly, Phoebe, are you planning to spend a month here? When I took her up to my room, she asked if she was going to be sharing the room with me. Why no, Phoebe, I said. We built a whole new extension just for you. You don't have to be sarcastic, she said. I was only teasing, Phoebe. But there's only one bed. Good powers of observation, Phoebe. I thought you might sleep downstairs on the couch. People usually try to make their guests comfortable. She looked around my room. We're going to be a little crowded in here, aren't we? I did not answer. I did not bash her over the head. I knew why she was acting this way. She sat down on my bed and bounced on it a couple times. I guess I'll have to get used to your lumpy mattress, Sal. Mine is very firm. A firm mattress is much better for your back. That's why I have such good posture. The reason you slouch is probably because of this mattress. Slouch, I said. Well, you do slouch, Sal. Look in the mirror sometime. She mashed on my mattress. Don't you know anything about having guests? You're supposed to give your guests the best that you have. You're supposed to make some sacrifices, Sal. That's what my mother always says. She says, in life, you have to make some sacrifices. I suppose your mother made a great sacrifice when she took off, I said. I couldn't help it. She was really getting on my nerves. My mother didn't take off. Someone kidnapped her. She was undergoing tremendous sacrifice at this very moment in time. She started unpacking. Where shall I put my things? When I opened the closet, she said, What a mess. Do you have some extra hangers? I'm supposed to leave my clothes jammed up in the suitcase all weekend? A guest is supposed to have the best. It is only courtesy, Sal. My mother says, I know, I know, sacrifice. Ten minutes later, Phoebe mentioned that she was getting a headache. It might even be a migraine. My aunt's foot doctor used to get migraines, only they turned out not to be migraines at all. Do you know what they were? What? I said, a brain tumor. Really? I said, yes, Phoebe said, in her brain. Well, of course it would be in her brain, Phoebe. I figured that out when you said it was a brain tumor. I don't think... That's a particularly sympathetic way to speak to someone with a migraine or a potential brain tumor. In my book was a picture of a tree. I drew a round head with curly hair, put a rope around the neck, and attached it to that tree. It went on and on like that. I hated her that day. I didn't care how upset she was about her mother. I really hated her, and I wanted her to leave. I wondered if this was how my father felt when I threw all those temper tantrums. Maybe he hated me for a while. After dinner, we walked over to Mary Lou's. Mr. and Mrs. Finney were rolling around on the front lawn in a pile of leaves with Tommy and Dougie, and Ben was sitting on the porch. I sat down beside him while Phoebe went looking for Mary Lou. Ben said, Phoebe's driving you crazy, isn't she? I looked the way he looked right in your eyes when he talked to you. Extensively, I said. I bet Phoebe is lonely. I don't know what came over me, but I almost reached up and touched his face. My heart was thumping so loudly that I thought he would be able to hear. I went into the house. From the back window, I watched Mrs. Finney climb a ladder, placed against the garage. On the roof, she took off her jacket and spread it out. A few months later, Mr. Finney came around the back of the house and climbed up the ladder. He took off his jacket and spread it out next to her. He lay down on the roof and put his arm around her. He kissed her. On the roof in the wide open air, they lay three. They lay there kissing each other. It made me feel peculiar. They reminded me of my parents before the stillborn baby, before the operation. Ben came into the kitchen. As he reached into the cupboard for a glass, he stopped and looked at me. Again, I had that odd sensation that I wanted to touch his face, right there on his cheek, in that soft spot. I was afraid my hand might just lift up and drift over to him if I was not careful. It was most peculiar. Guess where Mary Lou is, Phoebe said when she came in. She's with Alex. On a date. I had never been on a date. Neither I assumed had Phoebe. That night in my house, I pulled the sleeping bag out of the closet and spread it on the floor. Phoebe looked at it as if it were a spider. Don't worry, I said. I'll sleep in it. I crawled in and pretended to fall asleep immediately. I heard Phoebe get into bed. A little later, my father came into the room. 
Phoebe, he said, is something the matter? No, she said. I thought I heard someone crying. Are you okay? Yes, she said. Are you sure? Yes. I felt bad for Phoebe. I knew I should get up and try to be nice, but I remembered when I had felt like that. And I knew that sometimes you just wanted to be alone with the birds of sadness. Sometimes you had to cry by yourself. That night, I dreamed that I was sitting on the grass, peering through a pair of binoculars. Far off in the distance, my mother was climbing up a ladder. She kept climbing and climbing. It was thumpingly tall ladder. She couldn't see me, and she never came down. Just kept on going. Chapter 27, Pandora's Box The next day, as I was helping Phoebe lug her suitcase home, I said, Phoebe, I know you've been upset lately. I have not been upset lately, she said. Sometimes, Phoebe, I like you a lot. Why, thank you. But sometimes, Phoebe, I feel like dumping your cholesterol-free body out the window. She did not have a chance to respond because we were at her house, and she was more interested in besieging her father with questions. Any news? Did Mom come back? Did she call? Sort of, he said. She phoned Mrs. Cadaver. Mrs. Cadaver? What for? Why would she... Phoebe, calm down. I don't know why she phoned Mrs. Cadaver. I haven't been able to speak to Mrs. Cadaver myself yet. She isn't home. She left a note here. He showed it to Phoebe. Norma called to say she is okay. Beneath Mrs. Cadaver's signature was a P.S. saying that Mrs. Cadaver would be away until Monday. I don't believe that Mom called Mrs. Cadaver. Mrs. Cadaver's making it up. Mrs. Cadaver probably killed her and chopped her up. I'm calling the police. They had a huge argument, but at last Phoebe fizzled out. Her father said he had been calling everyone he could think of to see if her mother had indicated where she might be going. He would continue calling tomorrow, he promised, and he would speak to Mrs. Cadaver if he did not receive a letter or a direct phone call from her mother by Wednesday, he would call the police. Phoebe came out on the porch with me as I was leaving. She said, I've made a decision. I'm going to call the police. I might even go to the police station. I don't have to wait until Wednesday. I can go whenever I want. That night, she phoned me. She was both spring again. It seems so quiet here. I don't know what is the matter with me. I was lying on my bed, and I can't sleep. My bed's too hard. On Monday, Phoebe gave her oral report on Pandora. She began in a quivering voice. For some reason, Ben already talked about my topic, Pandora, when he did his report on Prometheus. However, Ben had made a few little mistakes about Pandora. Everyone turned around to stare at Ben. I did not, he said. Yes, you did. Phoebe's lip trembled. Pandora was not sent to a man as a punishment, but as a reward. Was not, Ben said. Was too, Phoebe said. Zeus decided to give man a present since man seemed lonely down there on earth with only the animals to keep him company. So Zeus made a sweet and beautiful woman and then Zeus invited all the gods to dinner. It was a very civilized dinner with matching plates. Mary Lou and Ben exchanged an eyebrow message. Zeus asked the gods to give the woman presents to make her feel like a welcome guest. Phoebe glanced at me. They gave her wonderful things, a fancy shawl, a silver dress, beauty. Ben interrupted. I thought you said she was already beautiful. They gave her more beauty. Are you satisfied? Her lip was no longer trembling, but she was blushing. The gods also gave her the ability to sing, the power of persuasion, a gold crown, flowers, and many truly wonderful things such as that. Because of all these gifts, Zeus named her Pandora, which means the gift of all. Phoebe was getting into it. There were two other gifts that I have not mentioned yet. One of them was curiosity. That is why all women are curious, by the way, because it was a gift given to the very first woman. Ben said, I wish she had been given the gift of silence. Last, there was a beautiful box covered in gold and jewels, and this is very important. She was forbidden to open the box. Ben said, then why did they give it to her? He was beginning to irritate Phoebe. You could tell. She said, that's what I'm telling you. It was a present. But why did they give her a present that she couldn't open? I do not know. It's just in the story. As I was saying, 
Pandora was not supposed to open the box, but because she had been given so much curiosity, she really, really, really wanted to know what was inside. So one day, she opened the box. I knew it, Ben said. I knew she was going to open that box the minute that you said that she was not supposed to open it. Inside the box were all the evils in the world, such as hatred, envy, plagues, sickness, and cholesterol. There were brain tumors and sadness, lunatics and kidnapping, and murders. She glanced at Mr. Berkway before rushing on. And all that kind of thing, Pandora tried to close the lid when she saw the horrible things that were coming out of it. But she could not get it closed, and that is why there are all these evils in the world. There is only one good thing in the box. What was it? Ben asked. As I was about to explain, the only good thing in the box was hope. And that is why, even though there are many evils in the world, there is still a little hope. She held up a picture of Pandora opening the box and a whole shebang of gremlins floating out. Pandora looked frightened. That night, I kept thinking about Pandora's box. I wondered why someone would put a good thing, such as hope, in a box with sickness and kidnapping and murder. It was fortunate that it was there, though. If not, people would have the birds of sadness nesting in their hair all the time because of nuclear war and the greenhouse effect and bombs and stabbings and lunatics. There must be another box with all the good things in it, like sunshine and love and trees and all that. Who had the good fortune to open that one? And was there one bad thing down there in the bottom of the good box? Maybe it was worry. Even when everything seems fine and good, I worry that something will go wrong and change everything. My mother, my father, and I all seemed fine and happy at our house until the baby died. Could you actually say that the baby died since it never breathed? Did its birth and death occur at the same moment? Could you die before you were born? Phoebe's family had not seemed fine even before the arrival of the lunatic and the messages and the disappearance of Mrs. Winterbottom. I knew that Phoebe was convinced that her mother was kidnapped because it was impossible for Phoebe to imagine that her mother could leave for any other reason. I wanted to call Phoebe and say that maybe her mother had gone looking for something. Maybe her mother was unhappy. Maybe there was nothing Phoebe could do about it. When I told this part to Grandma Gramps, Gramps said, You mean it had nothing to do with Phoebe? They looked at each other. They didn't say anything, but there was something in that look that suggested I had just said something important. For the first time, it occurred to me that maybe my mother's leaving had nothing whatsoever to do with me. It was separate and apart. We couldn't own our mothers. On that night, after Phoebe had given her Pandora report, I thought about the hope in Pandora's box. Maybe, when everything seemed sad and miserable, Phoebe and I could both hope that something might start to go right. Chapter 28, The Black Hills When we saw the first sign of the Black Hills, the whispers changed and once again commanded, Rush, hurry, rush. We had spent too long in South Dakota. There were only two days left and a long way to go. Maybe we should skip the Black Hills, I said. What? Graham said, skip the Black Hills? Skip Mount Rushmore? We can't do that. But today is the 18th. It's the fifth day. Do we have a deadline someone didn't tell me about? Gramps asked. Heck, we've got all the time in the... Graham gave him a look. I've just got to see these Black Hills, Graham said. We'll be quick about it, Chickabitty. The whispers wallowed me. Rush, rush. I knew we wouldn't make it to Idaho in time. I thought about sneaking off while Graham and Gramps weren't looking at the Black Hills. Maybe I could hitch a ride with someone who drove fast. But the thought of someone speeding, careening around curves, especially the snaking curves down into Lewiston, Idaho, which I had heard so much about, when I thought about that, it made me dizzy and sick. Heck, Graham said, I ought to turn this wheel over to you, take a bitty. All this driving is making me crazy as a loon. He was only joking, but he knew I could drive. He had taught me to drive his old pickup truck when I was 11. We used to ride around on the dirt roads on their farm. I drove and he smoked his pipe and told stories. He said, you're a hell of a driver, Chickabitty, but don't tell your mom I taught you. She'd thrash me half to death. I used to love that old green pickup truck. I dreamed about turning 16 and getting my license, but then mama left. Something happened to me. I became afraid of things I'd never been be afraid of before, and driving was one of these things. 
I didn't even like to ride in cars, let alone drive the truck. The black hills were not really black. Pines covered the hills, and maybe at dusk they looked black. But when we saw them at midday, they were dark green. It was an eerie sight, all those rolling dark hills. A cool wind blew down through the pines, and the trees swished secrets among them. My mother had always wanted to see the Black Hills. It was one of the sights she was most looking forward to on her trip. She used to tell me about the Black Hills, which were sacred to the Sioux Indians. It was their holy land, but white settlers took it as their own. The Sioux were still fighting in their land. I half expected the Sioux to stop our car from entering. And the thing is, I would have been on his side. I would have said, take it, it's yours. We drove through the Black Hills to Mount Rushmore. At first, we didn't think we were in the right place, but then, jing bang, it was right before us. There, high up on a cliff face, were the 60-foot-tall faces of Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt, carved right into the rock, staring somberly down on us. It was fine seeing the presidents. I've got nothing against the presidents. But you'd think the Sioux would be mighty sad to have those white faces carved into their sacred hill. I bet my mother was upset. I wondered why whoever carved them couldn't have put a couple Indians up there, too. Graham and Graham seemed disappointed as well. Graham didn't even want to get out of the car, so we didn't stay long. Graham said, I've had enough of South Dakota. How about you, Chickabitty? How about you, Gooseberry? Let's get a move on. By late afternoon, we were well into Wyoming, and I added up the miles left to go. Maybe we could make it. Just maybe. Then Graham said, I hope nobody minds if we stop at Yellowstone. It would be a sin to miss Yellowstone. Graham said, Is that where Old Faithful is? Oh, I would love to see Old Faithful. She looked back at me. We'll hurry. Why, I bet we'll be in Idaho by the 20th without any problem at all. Chapter 29. The Tide Rises Did Peavy's mother call? Graham said. Did she come home? Did Peavy phone the police? Oh, I hope this isn't a sad story. Phoebe did go to the police. It was on the day that Mr. Berkway read us the poem about the tide and the traveler, a poem that had set both me and Phoebe, and I think it is what convinced her, finally, that she had to tell the police about her mother. Mr. Berkway read a poem by Longfellow, The Tide Rises, The Tide Falls. The way Mr. Berkway read his poem, you could hear the tide rising and falling, rising and falling. In the poem, a traveler is hurrying towards a town and is getting darker and darker. And the sea calls to the traveler. Then the waves, with their soft white hands, wash out the traveler's footprints. The next morning, the day returns, but never more, returns the traveler to the shore. And the tide rises, the tide falls. Mr. Berkway asked for reactions to this poem. Megan said it sounded soft and gentle and almost made her go to sleep. Gentle, I said, it's terrifying. My voice was shaking. Someone is walking along the beach, and the night is getting black, and the person keeps looking behind him to see if someone is following, and a jing-bang wave comes up and pulls him into the sea? A murderer, Phoebe said. I went barreling on as if it was my poem and I was an expert. The waves with their soft white hands grab the traveler. They drown him. They kill him. He's gone. Ben said, maybe he didn't drown. Maybe he just died, like normal people die. Phoebe said, he drowned. I said, it isn't normal to die. It isn't normal. It's terrible. Megan said, what about heaven? What about God? Mary Lou said, God, is he in this poem? Ben said, maybe dying could be normal and terrible. When the bell rang, I raced out of the room. Phoebe grabbed me. Come on, she said. From her locker... She took the evidence she had brought from home, and we both ran the six blocks to the police station. I'm not exactly sure why I went along with Phoebe. Maybe it was because of that poem about the traveler, or maybe it was because I had begun to believe her and believe in the lunatic. Or maybe it was because Phoebe was taking some action, and I admired her for that. I wished I had taken some action when my mother left. I was not sure what I could have done, but I wished I had done something. Phoebe and I stood for five minutes outside the police station, trying to make our hearts slow down, and then we went inside and stood on the counter. On the other side of it, a thin man with big ears was writing in a black book. Excuse me, Phoebe said. I'll be right with you, he said. 
This is absolutely urgent. I need to speak to someone about a murder. Phoebe said. He looked up quickly. A murder? Yes, Phoebe said, or possibly a kidnapping, but the kidnapping might turn into a murder. Is this a joke? No, it is not a joke, Phoebe said. Just a minute. He whispered to a plump woman in a dark blue uniform. She wore glasses with thick lenses. Is this something you girls have read about in a book, she asked. No, it is not, I said. That was a turning point, I think, when I came to Phoebe's defense. I didn't like the way the woman was looking at us, as if we were two fools. I wanted that woman to understand why Phoebe was so upset. I wanted her to believe Phoebe. May I ask who it is who has been kidnapped or possibly murdered? The woman said. Phoebe said, my mother. Oh, your mother. Come along, then. Her voice was sugary and sweet, as if she was speaking to a chi to tiny children. We followed her into a room with class with glass partitions, an enormous man with a huge head and neck and massive sh shoulders sat behind the desk. His hair was bright red and his face was covered in freckles. He did not smile when we entered. After the woman repeated what we had told her, he stared at us for a long time. His name was Sergeant Bickle, and Phoebe told him everything. She explained about her mother disappearing and the note from Mrs. Cadaver and Mrs. Cadaver's missing husband and the Rhododendron, and finally about the lunatic and the mysterious messages. At this point, Sergeant Bickle said, What sort of messages? Phoebe was prepared. She pulled them out of her book bag and laid them on the desk in the order in which they had arrived. He read each one aloud. Don't judge a man until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. Everyone has his own agenda. In the course of a lifetime, what does it matter? You can't keep the birds of sadness from flying over your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. Sergeant Bickle looked up at the woman standing next to us, and the corners of his mouth twitched slightly. To Phoebe, he said, And how do you think these are related to your mother's disappearance? I don't know, she said. That's what I want you to find out. Sergeant Bickle asked Phoebe to spell Mrs. Cadaver's name. It means corpse, Phoebe said. Dead body. I know. Is there anything else? Phoebe pulled out the envelope with the unidentifiable hair strands. Perhaps you could have these analyzed, she, she suggested. Sergeant Bickle looked at the woman, and again the corners of his mouth twitched slightly. The woman removed her glasses and wiped the lenses. They were not taking us seriously, and I felt my ornery donkey self waking up. I mentioned the potential blood spots that Phoebe had marked with adhesive tape, but my father removed the tape, Phoebe said. Sergeant Bickle said, I wonder if you would excuse me a few minutes? He asked the woman to stay with us, and he left the room. The woman asked Phoebe about school and about her family. She had an awful lot of questions. I kept wondering where Sergeant Bickle had gone and when he was coming back. He was gone for over an hour. There were three framed pictures on Sergeant Bickle's desk, and I tried to lean forward to see them, but I couldn't. I was afraid the woman would think I was nosy. Sergeant Bickle finally returned. Behind him was Phoebe's father. Phoebe looked extensively relieved, but I knew it was not a coincidence that her father was there. Miss Winterbottom, Sergeant Bickle said, your father is going to take you and your friend home now. But, Phoebe said, Mr. Winterbottom, we'll be in touch. And if you would like me to speak with Mrs. Cadaver... Oh, no, Mr. Winterbottom said. He looked embarrassed. Really, that won't be necessary. I do apologize. We followed Mr. Winterbottom outside. In the car, he said nothing. I thought he might drop me off at my house, but he didn't. When we got to their house, the only thing he said was, Phoebe, I'm going to go talk with Mrs. Cadaver. You and Sal wait here. Mrs. Cadaver was unable to talk to him any more. Mrs. Cadaver was unable to give him any more information about Phoebe's mother's call. All Mrs. Winterbottom had said was that she would phone soon. That's all? Phoebe asked. Your mother also asked Mrs. Cadaver how you and Prudence were. Mrs. Cadaver told her that you and Prudence were fine. Well, I am not fine, Phoebe said. And what does Mrs. Cadaver know anyway? And besides, Mrs. Cadaver is making the whole thing up. You should let the police talk to her. You should ask her about the Rhododendron. You should find out who this lunatic is. Mrs. Cadaver probably hired him. You should. Phoebe, your imagination is running away with you. 
It is not. Mom loves me, and she would not leave me without any explanation. And then her father began to cry. Chapter 30, Breaking In Call dang, Graham said. What a lot of birds of sadness wing ding in their way around Peavy's family. Graham said, You liked Peavy, didn't you, Selmanica? I did like Phoebe, in spite of all her wild tales and her cholesterol madness and her annoying comments. There was something about Phoebe that was like a magnet. I was drawn to her. I was pretty sure that underneath all that odd behavior was someone who was frightened. And in a strange way, she was like another version of me. She acted out the way I sometimes felt. I do not think that Phoebe actually planned to break into Mrs. Cadaver's house. But as Phoebe was going... To bed, she saw Mrs. Cadaver in her nurse's uniform get into her car and leave. Phoebe waited until her father was asleep, and then she phoned me. You've got to come with... You've got to come over, she said. It's urgent. But Phoebe, it's late. It's dark. It's urgent, Sal. Phoebe was waiting in front of Mrs. Cadaver's house. There were no lights on at Mrs. Cadaver's. Phoebe said, come on, and she started up the walk. I admit that I was reluctant. I just want to take a quick look, she said. She crept up onto the porch and stood by the door. She listened, tapped twice, and turned the doorknob. The door was unlocked. I don't think Phoebe intended to go inside, but she did. And I followed. We stood in the dark hallway in the room to the right. A shaft of light from the street lamp came in through the window. We went into that room. We both nearly leaped through the window when someone said, Sal? I started backing towards the door. It's a ghost, Phoebe said. Come here, the voice said. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I could see someone huddled in a chair in the far corner. When I saw the cane, I was relieved. Mrs. Partridge? Come over here, she said. Who's that with you? Is that Phoebe? Phoebe said, yes. Her voice was high and quivery. I was just sitting there reading, Miss Partridge said. Isn't it awfully dark in here, I said, bumping a table. Mrs. Partridge laughed her wicked laugh. It's always dark in here. I don't need lights, but you can turn some on if you want to. As I stumbled around looking for a lamp, Phoebe stood frozen near the doorway. There, I said, that's much better. Mrs. Partridge was sitting in a big, overstuffed chair. She was wearing a purple bathrobe and pink slippers with floppy bunny ears at the toes. On her lap was a book, her fingers resting on the page. Is it Braille? I asked, waving at Phoebe to come into the room. I was afraid she was going to run out and leave me. Miss Partridge handed me the book, and I slid my fingers over the raised bumps. How did you know it was us? I asked. I just knew, she said. Your shoes make a particular sound, and you have a particular smell. What's the name of this book? What's it about? Mrs. Partridge said, Murder at Midnight. It's a mystery. Phoebe said, Erp! and looked around the room. Each time I went into that house, I noticed new things. It was a scary place. The walls were lined with shelves crammed with old, musty books. On the floor were three rugs with dark, swirly patterns of wild beasts and forests. Two chairs were covered in sim similar ghastly designs. A sofa was draped in a bear skin. On the wall behind the couch were two thumpingly grim African masks. The mouse, the mouse on the masks were wide open, as if in the midst of a scream. Everywhere you looked, there was something startling. A stuffed squirrel, a kite in the shape of a dragon, a wooden cow with a spear piercing its side. Goodness, Phoebe said. What a lot of, of unusual things. She knelt to examine a spot on the floor. What's the matter, Mrs. Partridge said. Phoebe jumped up. N nothing, nothing whatsoever. Did I drop something on the floor, Mrs. Partridge asked. N no, nothing whatsoever on the floor. Phoebe said, leaning against the back of the sofa, was an enormous sword. Phoebe examined the blade. Careful you don't cut yourself, Mrs. Partridge said. Phoebe stepped back. Even I found this unsettling that Mrs. Partridge could see what Phoebe was doing, even though she couldn't actually see her. Mrs. Partridge said, isn't this a grand full room? Grand full, and a little peculiar bowl too, I suppose. Phoebe and I have to be going. We backed towards the door. By the way, Mrs. Partridge said as we reached the doorway, what was it you wanted? Phoebe looked at me and I looked at Phoebe. 
We were just passing by, I said, and we thought we would see how you were doing. That's nice, Mrs. Partridge said, patting her knees. Oh, Phoebe, I think I met your brother. Phoebe said, You don't have a brother? Oh, Mrs. Partridge chapped her head. I guess this old noggin isn't as sharp as it used to be. As we left, she said, Goodness, you girls stay up late. Outside, Phoebe said, I'll make a list of items which the police will want to investigate further. The sword, the suspicious spot on the floor, and several hair strands which I picked up. Phoebe, you know when you said that your mother would never leave without an explanation? Well, she might. A person, a mother, might do that. Phoebe said, my mother wouldn't. My mother loves me. But she might love you and still not have been able to explain. I was thinking about the letter my mother left me. Maybe it would be too painful for her to explain. Maybe it would seem too permanent. I don't know when the world you were talking about. She might not come back, Phoebe. Shut up, Sale. She might not. I was just thinking you should be prepared. She is too coming back. You don't know what you're talking about. You're being horrid. Phoebe ran into the house. When I got home and had crept up to my room, I remembered how Phoebe had shown me some things in her room that reminded her of her mother. A handmade birthday card, a photograph of Phoebe and her mother, and a bar of lavender soap. When Phoebe pulled the blouse out of the closet, she said she could see her mother standing at the ironing board, smoothing the blouse with her hand. The wall opposite Phoebe's bed was painted violet. She said, My mother painted it last summer while I painted the trim at the bottom. And I knew exactly what Phoebe was doing and exactly why. I had done the same things when my mother left. My father was right. My mother did haunt our house and buy banks and the fields and the barn. She was everywhere. You couldn't look at a single thing without re being reminded of her. When we moved to Euclid, one of the first things I did was to unpack gifts my mother had given me. On the wall, I tacked the poster of the red hen which my mother had given me for my fifth birthday in the drawing of the barn she had given me for my last birthday. On my desk were pictures of her and cards from her. On the bookshelf, the wooden animals and books were presents from her. Sometimes I would walk around the room and look at each of these things and try to remember exactly the day she had given them to me. I tried to picture what the weather was like and what room we were in and what she was wearing and what precisely she had said. This was not a game. It was a necessary, crucial thing to do. If I did not have these things and remember these occasions, then she might disappear forever. She might never have been. In my bureau were things were three things of hers that I had taken from her closet after she left. A red fringe shawl, a blue sweater, and a yellow flowered cotton dress that was always my favorite. These things had her smell on them. Once before she left, my mother said that if you visualize something happening, you can make it happen. For example, if you were about to run a race, you visualize yourself running the race and crossing the finish line first, and presto! When the time comes, it really happens. The only thing I did not understand was what if everyone visualized himself winning the race. Still, when she left, this is what I did. I visualized her reaching for the phone, then I visualized her draw dialing the phone. I visualized our phone number clicking through the wires. I visualized the phone ringing. It did not ring. I visualized her riding the bus back to buy banks. I visualized her walking up the driveway. I visualized her opening the door. It did not happen. While I was thinking about all of this that night, after Phoebe and I crept into Mrs. Cadaver's house, I also thought about Ben. I had the sudden urge to run over to the Finneys and ask him where his own mother was, but it was too late. The Finneys would be asleep. Instead, I lay there thinking of the poem about the traveler. And I could see the tide rising and falling, and those horrid white hands snatching the traveler. How could it be normal, that traveler dying? And how could such a thing be normal and terrible, both at the same time? I stayed awake the whole night. I knew that I had closed my eyes, I would see the tide and the white hands. I thought about Mr. Winterbottom crying. That was the saddest thing. It was sadder than seeing my own father cry, because my father is the sort of person you expect might cry if he was terribly upset. But I had never, ever expected Mr. Winterbottom, stiff Mr. Winterbottom, to cry. 
It was the first time I realized that he actually cared about Mrs. Winterbottom. As soon as it was daylight, I phoned Phoebe. Phoebe, we've got to find her. That's what I've been telling you, she said.